Complete Works of Swami Vivekananda. Volume 3. Lectures from Colombo to Amra. The Common Bases of Hinduism. On his arrival at Lahore the Swamiji was accorded a grand reception by the leaders, both of the Arya Samaj and of the Sanathana Dharma Sabha. During his brief stay in Lahore, Swamiji delivered three lectures. The first of these was on, the common bases of Hinduism, the second on, Bhakti, and the third one was the famous lecture on, the Vedanta. On the first occasion he spoke as follows. This is the land which is held to be the holiest even in holy area Vata. This is the Brahma Vata of which our great Manu speaks. This is the land from whence arose that mighty aspiration after the Spirit, a, which in times to come, as history shows, is to deluge the world. This is the land where, like its mighty rivers, spiritual aspirations have arisen and joined their strength, till they travelled over the length and breadth of the world and declared themselves with a voice of thunder. This is the land which had first to bear the brunt of all inroads and invasions into India. This heroic land had first to bear its bosom to every onslaught of the outer barbarians into Aryavata. This is the land which, after all its sufferings, has not yet entirely lost its glory and its strength. Here it was that in later times the gentle Nanak preached his marvellous love for the world. Here it was that his broad heart was opened and his arms outstretched to embrace the whole world, not only of Hindus, but of Mohammedans too. Here it was that one of the last and one of the most glorious heroes of our race, Guru Govinda Singh, after shedding his blood and that of his dearest and nearest for the cause of religion, even when deserted by those for whom this blood was shed, retired into the south to die like a wounded lion struck to the heart, without a word against his country, without a single word of murmur. Here, in this ancient land of ours, children of the land of five rivers, I stand before you, not as a teacher, for I know very little to teach, but as one who has come from the east to exchange words of greeting with the brothers of the west, to compare notes. Here am I not to find out differences that exist among us, but to find where we agree. Here am I trying to understand on what ground we may always remain brothers, upon what foundations the voice that has spoken from eternity may become stronger and stronger as it grows. Here am I trying to propose to you something of constructive work and not destructive. For criticism the days are past, and we are waiting for constructive work. The world needs, at times, criticisms even fierce ones. But that is only for a time, and the work for eternity is progress and construction, and not criticism and destruction. For the last hundred years or so, there has been a flood of criticism all over this land of ours, where the full play of Western science has been let loose upon all the dark spots and as a result the corners and the holes have become much more prominent than anything else. Naturally enough there arose mighty intellects all over the land, great and glorious, with the love of truth and justice in their hearts, with the love of their country, and above all, an intense love for their religion and their God. And because these mighty souls felt so deeply, because they loved so deeply, they criticized everything they thought was wrong. Glory unto these mighty spirits of the past. They have done so much good. But the voice of the present day is coming to us, telling, enough. There has been enough of criticism, there has been enough of fault finding. The time has come for the rebuilding, the reconstructing. The time has come for us to gather all our scattered forces, to concentrate them into one focus, and through that, to lead the nation on its onward march which for centuries almost has been stopped. The house has been cleansed. Let it be inhabited anew. The road has been cleared. March children of the Aryans. Gentlemen, this is the motive that brings me before you, and at the start I may declare to you that I belong to no party and no sect. They are all great and glorious to me, I love them all, 
and all my life I have been attempting to find what is good and true in them. Therefore, it is my proposal tonight to bring before you points where we are agreed, to find out, if we can, a ground of agreement. And if through the grace of the Lord such a state of things be possible, let us take it up, and from theory carry it out into practice. We are Hindus. I do not use the word Hindu in any bad sense at all, nor do I agree with those that think there is any bad meaning in it. In old times, it simply meant people who lived on the other side of the Indus. Today a good many among those who hate us may have put a bad interpretation upon it, but names are nothing. Upon us depends whether the name Hindu will stand for everything that is glorious everything that is spiritual, or whether it will remain a name of opprobrium, one designating the downtrodden, the worthless, the heathen. If at present the word Hindu means anything bad, never mind. By our action let us be ready to show that this is the highest word that any language can invent. It has been one of the principles of my life not to be ashamed of my own ancestors. I am one of the proudest men ever born, but let me tell you frankly, it is not for myself, but on account of my ancestry, the more I have studied the past, the more I have looked back, more and more has this pride come to me, and it has given me the strength and courage of conviction, raised me up from the dust of the earth, and set me working out that great plan laid out by those great ancestors of ours. Children of those ancient Aryans, through the grace of the Lord may you have the same pride, may that faith in your ancestors come into your blood, may it become a part and parcel of your lives, may it work towards the salvation of the world. Before trying to find out the precise point where we are all agreed, the common ground of our national life, one thing we must remember. Just as there is an individuality in every man, so there is a national individuality. As one man differs from another in certain particulars, in certain characteristics of his own, so one race differs from another in certain peculiar characteristics. And just as it is the mission of every man to fulfill a certain purpose in the economy of nature, just as there is a particular line set out for him by his own past karma, so it is with nations. Each nation has a destiny to fulfill, each nation has a message to deliver, each nation has a mission to accomplish. Therefore, from the very start, we must have to understand the mission of our own race, the destiny it has to fulfill, the place it has to occupy in the march of nations, the note which it has to contribute to the harmony of races. In our country, when children, we hear stories how some serpents have jewels in their heads, and whatever one may do with the serpent, so long as the jewel is there, the serpent cannot be killed. We hear stories of giants and ogres who had souls living in certain little birds, and so long as the bird was safe, there was no power on earth to kill these giants. You might hack them to pieces, or do what you like to them, the giants could not die. So with nations, there is a certain point where the life of a nation centers, where lies the nationality of the nation, and until that is touched, the nation cannot die. In the light of this we can understand the most marvelous phenomenon that the history of the world has ever known. Wave after wave of barbarian conquest has rolled over this devoted land of ours. Allah Akbar has rent the skies for hundreds of years and no Hindu knew what moment would be his last. This is the most suffering and the most subjugated of all the historic lands of the world. Yet we still stand practically the same race, ready to face difficulties again and again if necessary. And not only so, of late there have been signs that we are not only strong, but ready to go out, for the sign of life is expansion. We find today that our ideas and thoughts are no more cooped up within the bounds of India, but whether we will it or not, they are marching outside, filtering into the literature of nations, taking their place among nations, and in some, even getting a commanding dictatorial position. 
Behind this we find the explanation that the great contribution to the sum total of the world's progress from India is the greatest, the noblest, the sublimest theme that can occupy the mind of man. It is philosophy and spirituality. Our ancestors tried many other things. They, like other nations, first went to bring out the secrets of external nature as we all know, and with their gigantic brains that marvelous race could have done miracles in that line of which the world could have been proud forever. But they gave it up for something higher. Something better rings out from the pages of the Vedas. That science is the greatest which makes us know him who never changes. The science of nature, changeful, evanescent, the world of death, of woe, of misery, may be great, great indeed. But the science of him who changes not, the blissful one, where alone is peace, where alone is life eternal, where alone is perfection, where alone all misery ceases. That, according to our ancestors, was the sublimest science of all. After all, sciences that can give us only bread and clothes and power over our fellow men, sciences that can teach us only how to conquer our fellow beings, to rule over them, which teach the strong to domineer over the weak. Those they could have discovered if they willed. But praise be unto the Lord, they caught at once the other side, which was grander, infinitely higher, infinitely more blissful, till it has become the national characteristic till it has come down to us, inherited from father to son for thousands of years, till it has become a part and parcel of us, till it tingles in every drop of blood that runs through our veins, till it has become our second nature, till the name of religion and Hindu have become one. This is the national characteristic, and this cannot be touched. Barbarians with sword and fire, barbarians bringing barbarous religions, not one of them could touch the core. Not one could touch the jewel, not one had the power to kill the bird which the soul of the race inhabited. This, therefore, is the vitality of either race, and so long as that remains, there is no power under the sun that can kill the race. All the tortures and miseries of the world will pass over without hurting us, and we shall come out of the flames like Prahlada. So long as we hold on to this grandest of all our inheritances, spirituality. If a Hindu is not spiritual I do not call him a Hindu. In other countries a man may be political first, and then he may have a little religion, but here in India the first and the foremost duty of our lives is to be spiritual first, and then, if there is time, let other things come. Bearing this in mind we shall be in a better position to understand why, for our national welfare, we must first seek out to the present day all the spiritual forces of the race, as was done in days of yore and will be done in all times to come. National union in India must be a gathering up of its scattered spiritual forces. A nation in India must be a union of those whose hearts beat to the same spiritual tune. There have been sects enough in this country. There are sects enough, and there will be enough in the future, because this has been the peculiarity of our religion that in abstract principles so much latitude has been given that, although afterwards so much detail has been worked out, all these details are the working out of principles, broad as the skies above our heads, eternal as nature herself. Sects, therefore, as a matter of course, must exist here, but what need not exist is sectarian quarrel. Sects must be but sectarianism need not. The world would not be the better for sectarianism, but the world cannot move on without having sects. One set of men cannot do everything. The almost infinite mass of energy in the world cannot tie managed by a small number of people, here, at once we see the necessity that forced this division of labor upon us. The division into sects. For the use of spiritual forces let there be sects. But is there any need that we should quarrel when our most ancient books declare that this differentiation is only apparent, that in spite of all these differences there is a thread of harmony, that beautified unity, running through them all? Our most ancient books have declared. 
That which exists is one. Sages call him by various names. Therefore, if there are these sectarian struggles, if there are these fights among the different sects, if there is jealousy and hatred between the different sects in India, the land where all sects have always been honoured, it is a shame on us who dare to call ourselves the descendants of those fathers. There are certain great principles in which, I think, we, whether Shnavas, Shavas, Shaktas, or Ganapatyas, whether belonging to the ancient Vedantists or the modern ones, whether belonging to the old rigid sects or the modern reformed ones, are all one, and whoever calls himself a Hindu, believes in these principles. Of course there is a difference in the interpretation, in the explanation of these principles, and that difference should be there, and it should be allowed, for our standard is not to bind every man down to our position. It would be a sin to force every man to work out our own interpretation of things, and to live by our own methods. Perhaps all who are here will agree on the first point that we believe the Vedas to be the eternal teachings of the secrets of religion. We all believe that this holy literature is without beginning and without end, coeval with nature, which is without beginning and without end. And that all our religious differences, all our religious struggles must end when we stand in the presence of that holy book. We are all agreed that this is the last court of appeal in all our spiritual differences. We may take different points of view as to what the Vedas are. There may be one sect which regards one portion as more sacred than another, but that matters little so long as we say that we are all brothers in the Vedas, that out of these venerable, eternal, marvellous books has come everything that we possess today, good, holy, and pure. Well, therefore, if we believe in all this, let this principle first of all be preached broadcast throughout the length and breadth of the land. If this be true, let the Vedas have that prominence which they always deserve, and which we all believe in. First, then, the Vedas. The second point we all believe in is God, the creating, the preserving power of the whole universe, and under whom it periodically returns to come out at other periods and manifest this wonderful phenomenon, called the universe, we may differ as to our conception of God. One may believe in a God who is entirely personal, another may believe in a God who is personal and yet not human, and yet another may believe in a God who is entirely impersonal, and all may get their support from the Vedas. Still we are all believers in God. That is to say, that man who does not believe in a most marvellous infinite power from which everything has come, in which everything lives, and to which everything must in the end return, cannot be called a Hindu. If that be so, let us try to preach that idea all over the land. Preach whatever conception you have to give, there is no difference, we are not going to fight over it, but preach God. That is all we want. One idea may be better than another, but, mind you, not one of them is bad. One is good, another is better, and again another may be the best, but the word bad does not enter the category of our religion. Therefore, may the Lord bless them all who preach the name of God in whatever form they like. The more he is preached, the better for this race. Let our children be brought up in this idea, let this idea into the homes of the poorest and the lowest, as well as of the richest and the highest. The idea of the name of God. The third idea that I will present before you is that, unlike all other races of the world, we do not believe that this world was created only so many thousand years ago, and is going to be destroyed eternally on a certain day. Nor do we believe that the human soul has been created along with this universe just out of nothing. Here is another point I think we are all able to agree upon. We believe in nature being without beginning and without end. Only at psychological periods this gross material of the outer universe goes back to its finer state, thus to remain for a certain period, again to be projected outside to manifest all this infinite panorama we call nature. This wave-like motion was going on even before time began, 
through eternity, and will remain for an infinite period of time. Next, all Hindus believe that man is not only a gross material body. Not only that within this there is the finer body, the mind, but there is something yet greater. For the body changes and so does the mind. Something beyond, the Atman. I cannot translate the word to you for any translation will be wrong. That there is something beyond even this fine body, which is the Atman of man, which has neither beginning nor end, which knows not what death is. And then this peculiar idea, different from that of all other races of men, that this Atman inhabits body after body until there is no more interest for it to continue to do so, and it becomes free, not to be born again. I refer to the theory of samsara and the theory of eternal souls taught by our Shastras. This is another point where we all agree, whatever sect we may belong to. There may be differences as to the relation between the soul and God. According to one sect the soul may be eternally different from God, according to another it may be a spark of that infinite fire, yet again according to others it may be one with that infinite. It does not matter what our interpretation is, so long as we hold on to the one basic belief that the soul is infinite, that this soul was never created, and therefore will never die, that it had to pass and evolve into various bodies, till it attained perfection in the human one. In that we are all agreed. And then comes the most differentiating, the grandest and the most wonderful discovery in the realms of spirituality that has ever been made. Some of you, perhaps, who have been studying Western thought, may have observed already that there is another radical difference severing at one stroke all that is Western from all that is Eastern. It is this that we hold, whether we are Shaktas, Sauras, or Vshnavas, even whether we are Bordas or Jainas. We all hold in India that the soul is by its nature pure and perfect, infinite in power and blessed. Only, according to the dualist, this natural blissfulness of the soul has become contracted by past bad work, and through the grace of God it is again going to open out and show its perfection. While according to the monist, even this idea of contraction is a partial mistake, it is the veil of Maya that causes us to think there. Soul has lost its powers, but the powers are the fully manifest. Whatever the difference may be, we come to the central core, and there is at once an irreconcilable difference between all that is Western and Eastern. The Eastern is looking inward for all that is great and good. When we worship, we close our eyes and try to find God within. The Western is looking up outside for his God. To the Western their religious books have been inspired, while with us our books have been expired. Breath like they came, the breath of God, out of the hearts of sages they sprang, the mantra drashtas. This is one great point to understand, and, my friends, my brethren, let me tell you, this is the one point we shall have to insist upon in the future. For I am firmly convinced and I beg you to understand this one fact, no good comes out of the man who day and night thinks he is nobody. If a man, day and night, thinks he is miserable, low, and nothing, nothing he becomes, if you say yea, yea, I am, I am, so shall you be. And if you say I am not, think that you are not, and day and night meditate upon the fact that you are nothing, a, nothing shall you be. That is the great fact which you ought to remember. We are the children of the Almighty, we are sparks of the infinite, divine fire. How can we be nothings? We are everything, ready to do everything. We can do everything, and man must do everything. This faith in themselves was in the hearts of our ancestors, this faith in themselves was the motive power that pushed them forward and forward in the march of civilization. And if there has been degeneration, if there has been defect, mark my words, you will find that degradation to have started on the day our people lost this faith in themselves. Losing faith in oneself means losing faith in God. Do you believe in that infinite, good providence working in and through you? If you believe that this omnipresent one, the Antaryamin, 
is present in every atom, is through and through, otaprita, as the Sanskrit word goes, penetrating your body, mind and soul. How can you lose, heart? I may be a little bubble of water, and you may be a mountain high wave. Never mind. The infinite ocean is the background of me as well as of you. Mine also is that infinite ocean of life, of power, of spirituality, as well as yours. I am already joined. From my very birth, from the very fact of my life. I am in yoga with that infinite life and infinite goodness and infinite power, as you are, mountain high though you may be. Therefore, my brethren, teach this life-saving, great, ennobling, grand doctrine to your children, even from their very birth. You need not teach them Advaitism. Teach them Dvaitism, or any ism you please, but we have seen that this is the common ism all through India. This marvellous doctrine of the soul, the perfection of the soul, is commonly believed in by all sects. As says our great philosopher Kepler, if purity has not been the nature of the soul, it can never attain purity afterwards, for anything that was not perfect to my nature, even if it attained to perfection, that perfection would go away again. If impurity is the nature of man, then man will have to remain impure, even though he may be pure for five minutes. The time will come when this purity will wash out, pass away, and the old natural impurity will have its sway once more. Therefore, say all our philosophers, good is our nature, perfection is our nature, not imperfection, not impurity. And we should remember that. Remember the beautiful example of the great sage who, when he was dying, asked his mind to remember all his mighty deeds and all his mighty thoughts. You do not find that he was teaching his mind to remember all his weaknesses and all his follies. Follies there are, weakness there must be, but remember your real nature always. That is the only way to cure weakness, that is the only way to cure follies. It seems that these few points are common among all the various religious sects in India and perhaps in future upon this common platform, conservative and liberal religionists, old type and new type, may shake hands. Above all, there is another thing to remember, which I am sorry we forget from time to time, that religion, in India, means realization and nothing short of that. Believe in the doctrine, and you are safe, can never be taught to us, for we do not believe in that. You are what you make yourselves. You are, by the grace of God and your own exertions, what you are. Mere believing in certain theories and doctrines will not help you much. The mighty word that came out from the sky of spirituality in India was Anabuti, Realization, and Dawas are the only books which declare again and again. The Lord is to be seen. Bold, brave words indeed but true to their very core. Every sound, every vibration is true. Religion is to be realized, not only heard. It is not in learning some doctrine like a parrot. Neither is it mere intellectual assent. That is nothing. But it must come into us. A, eh? and therefore the greatest proof that we have of the existence of a God is not because our reason says so but because God has been seen by the ancients as well as by the moderns. We believe in the soul not only because there are good reasons to prove its existence, but, above all, because there have been in the past thousands in India, there are still many who have realized, and there will be thousands in the future who will realize and see their own souls. And there is no salvation for man until he sees God, realizes his own soul. Therefore, above all, let us understand this, and the more we understand it the less we shall have of sectarianism in India, for it is only that man who has realized God and seen him, who is religious. In him the knots have been cut asunder, in him alone the doubts have subsided. He alone has become free from the fruits of action who has seen him who is nearest of the near and farthest of the far. A. We often mistake mere prattle for religious truth mere intellectual operations for great spiritual realization, and then comes sectarianism, 
then comes fight. If we once understand that this realization is the only religion, we shall look into our own hearts and find how far we are towards realizing the truths of religion. Then we shall understand that we ourselves are groping in darkness, and are leading others to grope in the same darkness, then we shall cease from sectarianism, quarrel, arid fight. Ask a man who wants to start a sectarian fight, have you seen God? Have you seen the Atman? If you have not, what right have you to preach his name? You walking in darkness trying to lead me into the same darkness. The blind leading the blind, and both falling into the ditch. Therefore, take more thought before you go and find fault with others. Let them follow their own path to realization so long as they struggle to seek truth in their own hearts. And when the broad, naked truth will be seen, then they will find that wonderful blissfulness which marvelously enough has been testified to by every seer in India, by everyone who has realized the truth. Then words of love alone will come out of that heart, for it has already been touched by him who is the essence of love himself. Then and then alone, all sectarian quarrels will cease, and we shall be in a position to understand, to bring to our hearts, to embrace, to intensely love the very word Hindu and every one who bears the name. Mark me, then and then alone you are a Hindu when the very name sends through your galvanic shock of strength. Then and then alone you are a Hindu when every man who bears the name, from any country, speaking our language or any other language, becomes at once the nearest and the dearest to you. Then and then alone you are a Hindu when the distress of anyone bearing that name comes to your heart and makes you feel as if your own son were in distress. Then and then alone you are a Hindu when you will be ready to bear everything for them, like the great example I have quoted at the beginning of this lecture, of your great Guru Govind Singh. Driven out from this country, fighting against its oppressors, after having shed his own blood for the defense of the Hindu religion, after having seen his children killed on the battlefield. A. This example of the great Guru, left even by those for whose sake he was shedding his blood and the blood of his own nearest and dearest. He, the wounded lion, retired from the field calmly to die in the south but not a word of curse escaped his lips against those who had ungratefully forsaken him. Mark me, every one of you will have to be a Govind Singh, if you want to do good to your country. You may see thousands of defects in your countrymen, but mark their Hindu blood. They are the first gods you will have to worship even if they do everything to hurt you, even if every one of them send out a curse to you, you send out to them words of love. If they drive you out, retire to die in silence like that mighty lion, Govind Singh. Such a man is worthy of the name of Hindu. Such an ideal ought to be before us always. All our hatchets let us bury. Send out this grand current of love all round. Let them talk of India's regeneration as they like. Let me tell you as one who has been working, at least trying to work, all his life that there is no regeneration for India until you be spiritual. Not only so, but upon it depends the welfare of the whole world. For I must tell you frankly that the very foundations of Western civilization have been shaken to their base. The mightiest buildings, if built upon the loose sand foundations of materialism, must come to grief one day, must totter to their destruction some day. The history of the world is our witness. Nation after nation has arisen and based its greatness upon materialism, declaring man was all matter. A. In Western language, a man gives up the ghost, but in our language a man gives up his body. The Western man is a body first, and then he has a soul. With us a man is a soul and spirit, and he has a body. Therein lies a world of difference. All such civilizations, therefore, as have been based upon such sand foundations as material comfort and all that, have disappeared one after another, after short lives, from the face of the world. 
but the civilization of India and the other nations that have stood at India's feet to listen and learn, namely, Japan and China, live even to the present day, and there are signs even of revival among them. Their lives are like that of the phoenix, a thousand times destroyed, but ready to spring up again more glorious. But a materialistic civilization once dashed down, never can come up again. That building once thrown down is broken into pieces once for all. Therefore have patience and wait, the future is in store for us. Do not be in a hurry, do not go out to imitate anybody else. This is another great lesson we have to remember. Imitation is not civilization. I may deck myself out in a Raja's dress, but will that make me a Raja? An ass in a lion's skin never makes a lion. Imitation, cowardly imitation, never makes for progress. It is verily the sign of awful degradation in a man. A, when a man has begun to hate himself, then the last blow has come. When a man has begun to be ashamed of his ancestors, the end has come. Here am I, one of the least of the Hindu race, yet proud of my race, proud of my ancestors. I am proud to call myself a Hindu, I am proud that I am one of your unworthy servants. I am proud that I am a countryman of yours, you the descendants of the sages, you the descendants of the most glorious rishis the world ever saw. Therefore have faith in yourselves, be proud of your ancestors, instead of being ashamed of them. And do not imitate, do not imitate. Whenever you are under the thumb of others, you lose your own independence. If you are working, even in spiritual things, at the dictation of others, slowly you lose all faculty, even of thought. Bring out through your own exertions what you have, but do not imitate yet take what is good from others. We have to learn from others. You put the seed in the ground, and give it plenty of earth, and air, and water to feed upon. When the seed grows into the plant and into a gigantic tree, does it become the earth, does it become the air, or does it become the water? It becomes the mighty plant, the mighty tree, after its own nature, having absorbed everything that was given to it. Let that be your position. We have indeed many things to learn from others, yea, that man who refuses to learn is already dead, declares our Manu. Take the jewel of a woman for your wife, though she be of inferior descent. Learn supreme knowledge with service even from the man of low birth. And even from the Chandala, learn by serving him the way to salvation. Learn everything that is good from others, but bring it in, and in your own way absorb it. Do not become others. Do not be dragged away out of this Indian life. Do not for a moment think that it would be better for India if all the Indians dressed, ate, and behaved like another race. You know the difficulty of giving up a habit of a few years. The Lord knows how many thousands of years are in your blood. This national specialized life has been flowing in one way, the Lord knows for how many thousands of years. And do you mean to say that that mighty stream, which has nearly reached its ocean, can go back to the snows of its Himalayas again? That is impossible. The struggle to do so would only break it. Therefore, make way for the life current of the nation. Take away the blocks that bar the way to the progress of this mighty river cleanse its path, clear the channel, and out it will rush by its own natural impulse, and the nation will go on careering and progressing. These are the lines which I beg to suggest to you for spiritual work in India. There are many other great problems which, for want of time, I cannot bring before you this night. For instance, there is the wonderful question of caste. I have been studying this question, its pros and cons, all my life. I have studied it in nearly every province in India. I have mixed with people of all castes in nearly every part of the country, and I am too bewildered in my own mind to grasp even the very significance of it. The more I try to study it, the more I get bewildered. Still at last I find that a little glimmer of light is before me. 
I begin to feel its significance just now. Then there is the other great problem about eating and drinking. That is a great problem indeed. It is not so useless a thing as we generally think. I have come to the conclusion that the insistence which we make now about eating and drinking is most curious and is just going against what the Shastras required, that is to say, we come to grief by neglecting the proper purity of the food we eat and drink. We have lost the true spirit of it. There are several other questions which I want to bring before you and show how these problems can be solved, how to work out the ideas. But unfortunately the meeting could not come to order until very late, and I do not wish to detain you any longer now. I will, therefore, keep my ideas about caste and other things for a future occasion. Now, one word more and I will finish about these spiritual ideas. Religion for a long time has come to be static in India. What we want is to make it dynamic. I want it to be brought into the life of everybody. Religion, as it always has been in the past, must tend to the palaces of kings as well as the homes of the poorest peasants in the land. Religion, the common inheritance, the universal birthright of the race, must be brought free to the door of everybody. Religion in India must be made as free and as easy of access as is God's heir. And this is the kind of work we have to bring about in India, but not by getting up little sects and fighting on points of difference. Let us preach where we all agree and leave the differences to remedy themselves. As I have said to the Indian people again and again, if there is the darkness of centuries in a room and we go into the room and begin to cry, oh, it is dark, it is dark, will the darkness go? Bring in the light and the darkness will vanish at once. This is the secret of reforming men. Suggest to them higher things. Believe in man first. Why start with the belief that man is degraded and degenerated? I have never failed in my faith in man in any case, even taking him at his worst. Wherever I had faith in man, Though at first the prospect was not always bright, yet it triumphed in the long run. Have faith in man, whether he appears to you to be a very learned one or a most ignorant one. Have faith in man, whether he appears to be an angel or the very devil himself. Have faith in man first, and then having faith in him, believe that if there are defects in him, if he makes mistakes, if he embraces the crudest and the vilest doctrines, believe that it is not from his real nature that they come, but from the want of higher ideals. If a man goes towards what is false, it is because he cannot get what is true. Therefore the only method of correcting what is false is by supplying him with what is true. Do this, and let him compare. You give him the truth, and though your work is done. Let him compare it in his own mind with what he has already in him. And, mark my words, if you have really given him the truth, the false must vanish, light must dispel darkness, and truth will bring the good out. This is the way if you want to reform the country spiritually. This is the way, and not fighting, not even telling people that what they are doing is bad. Put the good before them. See how eagerly they take it, see how the divine that never dies, that is always living in the human, comes up awakened and stretches out its hand for all that is good, and all that is glorious. May he who is the creator, the preserver, and the protector of our race, the god of our forefathers, whether called by the name of Vishnu, or Shiva, or Shakti, or Ganapati, whether he is worshipped as Sigana or as Nirgana, whether he is worshipped as personal or as impersonal, may he whom our forefathers knew and addressed by the words, that which exists is one. Sages call him by various names. May he enter into us with his mighty love. May he shower his blessings on us. May he make us understand each other. May he make us work for each other with real love, with intense love for truth and may not the least desire for our own personal fame, our own personal prestige, our own personal advantage, enter into this great work of me, 
spiritual regeneration of India.